It's time for another episode of I Am Northwest Arkansas, the podcast covering the intersection of business, culture, entrepreneurship, and life in general here in the Ozarks. Whether you are considering a move to this area or trying to learn more about the place you call home, we've got something special for you. Here's our host, Randy Wilburn. Hey folks, and welcome back to another episode of I Am Northwest Arkansas. I'm your host, Randy Wilburn, and today I'm really excited. I am sitting in front of Meredith K. Lowry. Meredith is a patent attorney at Wright Lindsay Jennings here in Rogers. Uh, I believe they also have an office in Little Rock as well. And uh, and so uh, with, uh, without further ado, wanted to welcome Meredith to the show. How are you doing? Good. Thanks Good. for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. I had a chance to run into you actually at the Doing Business in Bentonville uh, program a couple of weeks ago that took place up in Bentonville of all places. And um, Andy Wilson and Casey Baker uh, from Doing Business in Bentonville had invited me to be a part of that program and you and some other people got a chance to speak to some of the vendors that were there and and uh, it was a it was a really bad day weather wise but it was a good day inside there were a lot of really great people there and and um, I had the pleasure of actually meeting you and the first thing I said to you was I'd love for you to come on my podcast and you said of course right exactly so no it worked out perfectly but I would love for you just to kind of share with the audience a little bit about yourself I mean you're you are somewhat of a of a, of a mini celebrity here in Northwest Arkansas as I look up and I told you this when I left the uh, doing business in Bentonville event I looked up at a cityscapes magazine and I'm like wait a minute that looks just like the lady that I asked to be on my podcast <laughs> and it was but you had pink hair could you tell us about that really quick? So recently, I was asked to be part of the Cohen Bigwigs part. Of the, it's a fundraiser that our local Cohen affiliate does every year to raise money during the months of September and October leading up to the Peak Ribbon Luncheon. And so I've been friends with the executive director for a number of years. Uh, I've kind of begged off a a little bit before, Mm -hmm. but this year I had time in my schedule. And (laughs) uh, so I said yes. And then, yes, I ended up on the front cover of Cityscapes, which I did not realize was going to happen. Right. But um, someone actually texted it to me one weekend, and I'm looking down at my apple watch seeing my face on my watch like wait a minute that's that should not be there why is my face on my watch that's funny now i have to ask did they supply the pink wig or did you have to go get one come and supply the pink wig i did buy a second one i have a well she's now seven year old daughter that um is named after my grandmother who had breast cancer and so we had matching wigs and there's a photo shoot that we did. I don't have photos around That's here. That's fine. But That's fine. Yeah, that we did together of her hamming it up with the wig. And <laughs> I think she likes the wig a lot more than I do. Than you do. How fun. I love that. Yeah, my uh, my mom was a breast cancer. So she is a breast cancer survivor. Um, she actually ended up getting a, a double mastectomy. She she kind of said, I want to be done with this and never see it again. And, and uh, thankfully, it's been 20 years uh, and she is a survivor, so um, certainly give a big shout out to all uh, everyone that is uh, that has been through or has a family member that has gone through breast cancer because it is a it is a very serious issue, and uh, I, I certainly applaud your ability to to lend yourself to that effort and, and and make light of it. And there were so many other people that had pink wigs on in the magazine issue. I saved it just to look at it because I showed my wife, and I was like, "Wow, look at all these all these folks that are out here supporting." Supporting uh, the Komen Foundation and what they're doing, so I think that's great. They're always looking for people to do it too, Randy. Uh, yeah, if you well, want to we'll, sign up, I don't know how I would look in with pink hair, but we'll we'll have to we'll have to see that uh, October will be here before you know it. So we'll oh, well. See, we'll see what happens, uh, what the future holds for us. But why don't you just tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Part of the um, 
the allure of, of why I created this podcast, because I really want to highlight individuals and in, in what they're doing in their own space. And you are you're doing a lot. And, and I kind of want to I want to get to it. I want to talk about your your philanthropic efforts, um, the way that you're giving back to the community, how the community gives back to you. I also want to talk about just your expertise from a patent uh, law standpoint, um, just simply because I think there are a lot of people that listen to this podcast that that may have questions about some of the basics or foundation of what is patent law, because a lot of people don't always understand it. So uh, I think we'll get into that as well. But but why don't you just give us just a quick snippet into your superhero origin story uh, of, of who Meredith Lowry is? Well, I am a patent attorney. Uh, so I I went to law school at one point in time. Uh, once I got done with law school, uh, I was kind of bored, actually. Wow. I mean, I was in private practice. It, there's only so many hours of the day that you can practice as a new attorney. Uh, my husband and I would both work fairly long hours, but we didn't have children. Uh, so the spare time, I was kind of chafing. I'd already renovated the house and <laughs> then i decided okay let's i need something else as an outlet and Komen actually was my first foray into philanthropy philanthropic activities um i uh, called the then executive director and said hey i want to volunteer and she's like well we have a meeting coming up why don't you come to that right Right. So I showed up and it was a committee meeting. I was thinking it was a volunteer activity. It wasn't. I sat there through the entire meeting just thinking, I'm in the wrong spot. I don't know why I'm here. That's funny. And the next morning, the chair for the Race for the Cure called and said, we would love you to consider being our registration chair. And at that point in time, I really didn't know what I was saying yes to. Mm -hmm. I just knew, okay, here are these nice people. I enjoyed spending time with them. Why not consider this? And that year, I think we had 16,000 registrants for the Race for the Cure. Wow. Which meant that my March and April were practice of law full time. And then this whole other full time job <laughs> of getting all of these names into a computer and folding all these t shirts. And uh, granted, we had volunteers. We had a lot of volunteers. Right. But orchestrating all of that, and thank goodness for all the other past volunteers that knew how to run this show. Right. Because right. I really had no clue. Man. And I stayed doing that five years. And at that point, I then had two small children and um, a full-time law practice. And so I stepped back from that after a while. But I still wanted to do extra stuff. And I had found, working through Komen, that it benefited my clients, too, Yeah. if I knew other people in the community, if yeah. I was out there and could say, oh, you need to talk to this person. You need to have drinks with this person. That was always a good thing for them. So I continued being involved with organizations that touched my heart or that I, I had good friends working with. So Okay. And I'd be curious to know, who, who was your inspiration growing up that kind of showed you that, you know, figuring out or finding ways to give of yourself, um, you know, without expecting anything return in return is, is kind of the way to go. Um, I'd, I'd be curious to know, did you have an example growing up that, cause I, for me, it was my grandfather. I mean, he would go, if, if anybody called him to go anywhere and speak, and I have yet to really tell his story on this podcast, but he's got a really interesting one. And one day I'll tell it, but whenever he would go and speak, he would do it. You know, sometimes he'd do it for, he'd do it for free. Most of the time, um, he was always available in his local community to give back in any way, shape or form. If there was ever any fundraising going on, he'd find ways to give. And so he was kind of like my North star when it came to that. And I saw that, you know what, there's there's something to this, to to giving of yourself for for programs that don't necessarily. I mean, they do give you something back, but it's not a. And I don't want to use this word loosely, but it's not a quid pro quo. And it's it's one of those things where it's it's and it's a little tongue in cheek humor there. But the bottom line is that there, there's always that individual that that 
acts as an example for you. And I'd be curious to know who, who was that person for you? It's more of a book really? than it was a person. I mean, my grandparents worked very hard. Yeah. My parents did too. My parents also had this thing of you, you have to do education. But there was a book growing up. It's called Miss Rumpheus, uh, and it's a children's book. And my daughter, my kids, and I have read it about once a week for forever. But um, they, we tend to, it, it talks about the three things that you're going to do to make the world more beautiful. Wow. Traveling the world and seeing things, but also making the world more beautiful and getting an education. And so I looked at it as, okay, I, I know to work hard from these people that I adore and I know to get an education, but what's that third thing going to be? And for the book, it was spreading wildflowers everywhere, but, um, uh, mine was different. So it's, it's called Mrs. Rumpheus. How do you I spell think that? How you say oh, it. really? Mrs. Rumpheus. I'll have to look it up and make sure that we put that in the show notes. Cause I, I love that. I love the fact that a book was your inspiration, um, I tell people all the time, books have, have such a, they have such a sway over me, um, and it has always been helpful. And, and I'm actually not the per- I wouldn't be the person that I am today if it wasn't for a lot of the literature and the books that I've you know kind of just had become a part of me. And it sounds like that book has become a part of you and has actually fueled a lot of what you've done. And when I think about what you've done, I'm looking down the list of things. It's it's not like you have uh, – I mean, you're a patent attorney. And patent attorneys, for those of you that don't know – and I know a little bit about law because I have some law, some lawyers in the family. But patent attorneys have to do an inordinate amount of reading. There is an inordinate amount of research that's involved with, with, with being a patent attorney. So it's not – you know, it's it's not cut and dry. And there's always a new wrinkle. That's the whole idea behind being a patent attorney. I mean, it's just always something new that you're entertaining and an idea and trying to determine, you know, what's going on. Am I, am I right or am I wrong? You're right. Okay. But I think also being a part of the community helps with that. It does. It because does. Because I, I spend a lot of time with the entrepreneur ecosystem and seeing what they're doing. When I started practicing law – was about the time Web 2.0 started just consuming us and social media. And everything changed. The way we look at the world changed. The way we innovate. And now we're walking around with these little computers in our pockets all the time. And the way we approach retail and consumers changed. So being a part of the ecosystem and being a part of the, the nonprofit world, I can see things in a different light. I, I think that helps me process, okay, this invention's coming in, but I understand your frame of reference more. I'm not sitting here just with my books and thinking, okay, I know everything because I don't. <laughs> right, right. Well, there's always something new, I think. Um, it's certainly you benefit uh, being here in this area with all the different programs. I know you have some involvement with Crystal Bridges. You, the arts is something that you're passionate about. Um, you, fit, you spent some time working with the Scotts Family Amazium. Yep. Um, and uh, I mean, there's just a lot of uh, a lot of programs that you've you've been involved with. And then uh, the NWA Tech Summit. What did you do with them? I was chair. I guess it's been two years now since I was chair, and we during that. When I was chair, we started the women in tech portion. Okay. We've changed how that is dealt with now. It's more of an integrated element into the tech summit. I still stayed on on the planning committee, but we've changed that into the so integrated program, but then also still focus on why do we need diverse talent in technology? And that's the in tech group that we have now and so i will be chair for that one more year and then i'll be phasing out okay all right well so I, obviously and i'm sure you have other things that you can be doing so that there, there's not a shortage of that uh, why don't you, you talk a little bit about um the 
what does this area represent to you? I mean, in Northwest Arkansas, we're, we're right in Ro- your your office is in Rogers. I mean, there's so much happening right behind us. I just noticed that for the first time the Top Golf. I didn't realize the nets are coming up, and that's right behind the Amp, um, which is the the Walmart Amphitheater, which is right off right off of 49 there at Exit Two in Rogers, and right behind it is all these huge nets, which is where the Top Golf is going to be. I mean, this area in the next five years you're not going to recognize it no you won't recognize it here in a year they're going to put another tower right there too right behind us i mean it's going to be insane yeah this this area is full of opportunity and I, i love watching that grow i grew up here i mean i was here back in the 80s when none of this was here i mean this wasn't here 15 years ago either but right. it's amazing watching how exponentially it has grown but also watching like how the community in some ways still stays the same yeah it's still approachable there's still the ability to be involved in all the nonprofits and in the entrepreneur ecosystem if you wanted to start a business you would probably trip over yourself, uh, over all the people wanting to help you. Help you, yeah. And yeah. that I love. That it's still very much a helping mindset. Yeah, I tried to explain it to somebody, and I've said it before here on the podcast. Um, you know, living in Boston for 17 years, I feel like I have the the right and the experience to say that it was a lot things were a lot different there. And and it wasn't that you couldn't get something started or get a business off the ground. It was just a lot harder. Um, you really had to show some proof before anybody would, would, would even would even give you the time of day. Here, that's not the case. And that's the one thing that I really do like, just like I was um, mentioning to you before we started this recording, um, just about everybody that I've asked to be on this podcast has said yes to me, which I'm really surprised at because I'm I'm just always waiting for people to say, no, I don't have time for that or no. It's always like, yeah, I'd love to. Let's figure something out. And then it's like it's always like, yes, and. So from an improvisational standpoint, it's not like, yeah, but, you know, I don't know if I have time. So we'll, we'll you know, maybe one day in the future. Everything is very specific here, and which is which is what I really like. And since you do represent Northwest Arkansas, and and this is a podcast for people that may be coming here or that are already here, um, the encouragement that I would have for anybody listening is that they just need to get in wherever they can and get involved because doors will open up for you. It just happens that way here. It does, and when you meet people, there's. A woman that spoke yesterday for Company Club, which is a group that I help with some things, and it's affiliated with a group that I run. But uh, that she, her name's Dominique Blake, and I love her first time I met her. She's like, "Well, who do I need to know? What do I need to know?" I mean, just ask. Right. I mean, those things. I I love that approach. She was so. She knew what she wanted, and uh, I immediately was like, okay, well, here are these people. Exactly. Here, go talk to them. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's actually how I've built the, uh, the, the, the list of guests. Every time that I speak with somebody, and I'll do it with you when I'm done, but I, I always ask, who, who do you think I should talk to? Who do you think I should have on the podcast? And then now, now I have regular listeners that are like, oh, you should get so-and-so, or you should get this person. And so everybody, there's, there's, all, there's like, like I said, two degrees of separation, and there's, there's so much connectivity here which really allows for, I, I don't know, just a spirit of openness that you don't always experience in a lot of places. So if, you, if, you're, if you're listening to this and you're in another part of the country and you're considering Northwest Arkansas, the one thing I would say, and, and Meredith, you could certainly concur, is just that that openness does exist here. And it, you know we, we will certainly leave, leave the light on for you and give you an opportunity to check things out. So um, why don't we talk a little bit about the, the fact of this this neighbor that we have right up the road here called Walmart, <laughs> and um, you know it's a it's a good uh, corporate citizen. Uh, you know, of course, we have JB Hunt, we have Tyson. I'm kind of being funny here, but uh, I know that you do a lot of patent work uh, with with companies and and products that you know are looking to or have gotten involved or doing business with Walmart. What what has what would you say Walmart has? 
has been or has meant to this area more than anything else? It's our way of life. It's... I remember what it was like before Walmart started growing up, uh, growing, and when when they brought in grocery. It's been a game changer. It's it's not just that they buy product from people that are here. It's also that they encourage their associates to be involved with the community. And sometimes those associates decide, I like it here, not really – fond of working at Walmart anymore. I want to start my own thing. That's my new passion. And so then they start up businesses here too. And we get more growth as a result. They bring in talent. They bring in people from all over the world that have differing viewpoints. That's a great thing. Yeah. yeah. I love watching how things grow here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, that's, that's the one thing that I'm excited about. And again, I have, uh, since being here in the last five years, I've, I've just had a newfound appreciation. I had read, uh, I was telling somebody this, uh, I read Sam Walton's autobiography years ago, and then I had to reread it once I got here. And then I had a different perspective after rereading it. And then kind of seeing things like Crystal Bridges and the impact that his family has had in this region. I mean, it is, It is off the chain, if I could use that expression. It really is when you look at just the extent to which they have impacted others, and and especially in a philanthropic perspective, right? Because, yes, the Waltons give. They've got the Walton Family Foundation. They've got a lot of programs. And then there's so many other foundations that are part of the ecosystem here in northwest Arkansas. And everybody's kind of like fighting, not fighting against each other, but, you know, fighting to make things a a better situation in, in general. And that's the experience that I've had, and, and that's why I've been blown away. I saw that you were um, affiliated with the Single Parent Scholarship Fund. Yeah. I had a, ch- a chance to sit down with Tyler Clark not too long ago. He's a great guy. Yes. And, uh, you know, so many of the programs that I see, and, you know, you see, you you read some of the local magazines, or you read the, the, the Northwest um, uh, Democrat Gazette, uh, you read any of the local business publications, and you see what all of these different organizations are doing, and kind of how how each piece fits in there nicely into the puzzle of of filling of giving back to this community. And so, I think that's really exciting. I, I um, you know, I don't know where it's going to end. Um, I just it ke- it continues to evolve and it continues to grow. So I don't see I don't see an end in sight. I think there are a lot of opportunities that are going to continue to expand in this area. What's up? Yeah. So, well, why don't you tell us a little bit about this whole understanding of patent law? If you had to give people just the cliff note version of understanding what patent law is all about and what you do on a regular basis. I know that uh, I was reading a little bit of your um, your resume and your background, and there are a lot of things that you fo- that you focus on. Um, uh, one thing that that they that you mentioned was publicity rights. Uh, and then uh, here in Nor- in Arkansas, and then I, I was curious to learn a little bit more about that. And then, you know, you do a lot of intellectual property counsel for startups, which is which I think is really important. But what what is this? I mean, have have things changed since you got into the law with regard to with social media and everything nowadays? How has that changed when it comes to our our identity and and how we can lay claim to that in, in a much larger system? The way I like to look at intellectual property with patents, trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets, and rights of publicity is more what does that mean for the individual business? Because not everyone's going to have a patent, and not everyone's going to have copyrights. Most people have a trademark of some sort. Um, But what does that mean for them, and what is – what's important to that business to then protect. Sometimes, like with the Broyles family, it's a matter of keeping Coach Broyles' name off of products that they might not like. Yeah. And seeing their dad's signature lifted off of a football and put on some product like he endorsed it. 
So that's where publicity rights come in. Okay. Sometimes it's just the commercialization of somebody's name or image. And that got passed in 2016. Okay. Uh, and so now it, it you can still you take pictures of people. You just can't use them for advertising. And that tends to, it's a bigger thing now. It's certainly than it was then it seems more and more we see things like holograms popping up yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and we've seen a couple of lawsuits lately in that realm and the larger outside world but um, i'm it, glad arkansas has joined that art outside world and protecting people and i'm glad you brought that up because you mentioned arkansas um is on a state by state level does that law is differ or is it the same across the board? It's similar to some of the other state laws. Uh, Tennessee has the broadest with El- Elvis being that, that the Presley family pushed on that one a long time ago. The Some of the states have a different version of it. Um, some publicity rights go away after the person dies and arkansas is not that way and it's not that way in a lot of other states too but that's that and trade secrets are pretty much the ones that are state law based and then everything else is federal based i mean you can have state trademarks but most people look at it in the federal sense of oh i have a restaurant that means i if someone in Tulsa is coming to my restaurant, they're going to recognize that it's my restaurant, even if they're going across state lines. Right, right. But, um, and products cross state lines easily, too. So, But with patents, that's the big one that most people find most fascinating. It's, it's innovation. It's how do you protect what's new and not – that hasn't been done before in any sort of way. And sometimes that can be tricky. It can be. (laughs) I I was just watching an episode of The Prophet, which is one of my favorite shows with Marcus Limonis. It's on CNBC. Big shout out to Marcus Limonis. Anyway, the episode had him working with a, a, a gentleman that had created a tap for a coconut. But he his tap for the coconut had actually already been presented to the patent office years ago. And so they already had a drawing. They had all the documentation for it. And his his tap really wasn't any alteration on what was already accepted. So each time that they presented the drawings and everything else to the patent office, it got pushed back. Uh, it was, and it got it de- de- denied like four times for review. And um, essentially, he was not able to uh, improve upon it. And, and because of that, whatever was already registered with the patent office, that that held out over somebody else's new idea. So I think it's interesting. And I just, you know, just seeing that the other day and I thought about that and I was like, man, I wanted to ask you about that because I know that that happens quite a bit that people think, oh, they've got the best idea when that idea may actually already exist and they just haven't, you know, they, they, if you can't improve upon it, then, you know, it's, you're basically just copying somebody else. We like to look at the differences And it's with inventions, those differences are the important things. Yeah. If if the tap had been able to cut through the coconut in a different mechanism, I mean, things like that, those differences are important, but not everything has a difference. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it's a, a different way of marketing it. There are a lot of patents out there. I mean, we're over 10 million patents Jeez. in utility, and then there's all the design patents as well, right. all the plant patents. Uh, those, uh, that doesn't mean that they were commercially successful. Yeah. And sometimes it's something completely different that's going to be out there that can be commercially successful, even though there's a patent that prevents you getting a patent issued. Right. Yeah. Right. What where do where do where does someone start 
that thinks they either have an idea or some type of creation or, or invention, uh, where, where do they start? Um, should should they come see you first, or is it more you should do your research? I mean, obviously we've got Doctor Google and we've got all this information at our disposal nowadays. But but where would someone start uh, to to determine if what they have is is indeed viable and uh, something that they may want to put more effort behind to determine if it's 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 worth pursuing the effort of a patent or something along those lines. I like talking to new inventors early, mainly because if they miss something in the process, I want them to know, wait a minute, here's this big, huge red flag that you need to be aware of and to avoid it. Uh, When you start talking to other people about your invention, your time starts running. The patent office wants you to file within a year of you publicly disclosing an invention. So if you go to some of the resources the ecosystem has and talk to them about it or do a pitch competition just to get a proof of concept funding, you've you've started your time running. That's yeah. not ideal. And then some people come to me way too late. And that's heartbreaking for me. It's devastating for them. But I like them to come talk to me. I also like them to do their research. Yeah. You're right. Dr. Google's out there. Right. Google actually has a separate search engine just for patents. Oh. Okay. It's more user-friendly than the patent office website because most people don't know how to search the patent office website. Right, right. It's kind of daunting, actually. It is. Yeah. Uh, with Google patents, you can search, and then it's a little more flexible in the keyword searching. Mm-hmm. You can also dive deeper into the search classifications, and they will show you little icons, and you can see, okay, structurally, the, I see this drawing of a coconut tap, and so I can look and see, okay, all these are a little bit different from mine, and start getting a sense of why yours is different, because... That's what I'm going to ask you. Why is yours different? And huh. then, and you can do the same for like trademark words and all of that. You can't for, at Google. You okay. can do that at the Patent and Trademark patent. Office. Okay. And that search engine, I, I'm on that all the time. I think that one's much more easier to use. To use, yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I, I have probably have some questions for you after this podcast is <laughs> okay. over. But but no, no, that that is. Um, I think that's really good. We'll we'll put the listing. So that separate search engine for Google is just Google. What do you search? Google. Um, Google Patents. Google Patents. Okay. We'll make sure we put that on the show notes so people know where to look. So a couple more questions before we wind up. I, I wanted to know, where, where does songwriting fall in? Does that fall into this at all or no? It does. It's it copyright. Does. It is copyright. So um I I was always told, and I had some friends that are musicians and some that are that are singers that have written a lot of songs. Um, I was told that you could you could actually write a song and then mail it to yourself, and that's pr- <laughs> so. I'm shaking my head vigorously. <laughs> so okay, I just want I wanted people to hear that. I know that you know that we're not Nashville, but I know that there are a lot of singer songwriters that live in this area, and I know people that are that are creators of their own you know, music and whether they've been inspired by other songs that they've heard or whatever, but I really want to kick the person that started this because it's not just copyright, right? It, it, they call it the poor man's copyright. And I always, everyone will ask me poor man's copyright, poor man's patent, poor man's trademark. And some people will walk in with me with this sealed letter and they're like, I patented it myself. I'm like, no, you didn't. You mailed yourself something. Right. It's proof that you mailed it, but <laughs> that's it. And yeah. it's just, it's hard. So that's a tremendous fallacy, basically. Oh, tremendous Tremendous. Fallacy. Okay. The other one that I hear a lot is, if I change it 10%, 5%, 25%, whatever percent, it's fine, and I can do that. Or I saw it on Google, so therefore I get to use it. And that's also not true. Oh my goodness! So I would assume that you also get a lot of people that come in here and ask you ask you to sign an NDA before they even open up and share with you what they're working on. They do. I don't sign them. My law license. 
already prevents me from doing that. Exactly, and exactly. That's worth more to me. <clears throat> well, yeah, one of my friends, you know, he he does a lot of business investing, and and one of his highlight, one of his warning signs is when somebody comes to him and says, "Listen, I need you to sign this NDA before I share anything with you." And uh, you know, I mean, how often is that truly necessary? Um, in, in a case like that, where you're just sharing some basic information, when it's someone that's not your attorney, I recommend it a lot for people because, I mean, ideas do sometimes get stolen, get stolen, yeah. or, or re envisioned. And I mean, it's it's amazing how we can see something, and I I'm guilty of this myself. Last week. One of my friends posted something about an event we both work on, and I immediately said almost the exact same thing in my post without even realizing it because our brains just take in information, and they don't always think through where did that come from. And mem- and mimicry is actually is, 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 is your brain is kind of trained. You mimic p- other people when they do things, especially so. when you're really good friends. Right, right, so. exactly, exactly. So, but, yeah, so that's I I like to look at NDAs in a very different manner. And I don't know, did we say what those are? Non disclosure agreements. Right. So I like to look at them as okay. You've got the preliminary non disclosure of we're just going to see, we're going to talk about l- surface level things. And they even say in the non disclosure agreement, we are just seeing if we can have a business relationship. And at that time, we will have a further detailed agreement. But then you also have the same thing for manufacturers or people that are testing your product, because a lot of people don't realize if you let Take your invention and have your brother or someone that you don't even like test it a little bit. And they say, hey, add this to your coconut tap. Right. Then it will work better. They've they've become an inventor there. Right, right. And joint inventorship's a big thing. So you I can see want, where that would go. Yeah, yeah, there could be some real misunderstandings there. Yes. So, yeah. Unfortunately, when money gets involved, um, it, yes. it's a slippery slope right there. So, and I, I didn't want this conversation to devolve into purely patent <laughs> law because I'm, I'm sure you could talk all day and you're already talking over my head. I understand some basic things, but I just, I did want to share that, um, with, with this audience and certainly anybody that's, that's in this area and, and could use, um, you know, Meredith's help uh, with a patent or copyright or any any of that nature, they can easily contact you, right? Okay. And what's the best way for them to do that? Right, Lindsay and Jennings has a website. Okay. My direct dials on there. Okay. It's WLJ.com. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I'll, we'll make sure we put that in the show notes. So anybody listening to this that has a great idea or you've, you've had uh, something sitting on the shelf for a long time and you thought it always had value, if you really want to figure that out, uh, Meredith would definitely be able to to kind of um, enlighten you as far as that's concerned. So definitely connect with her and, and see if it can help. And please let her know that you heard about it here first on I Am Northwest Arkansas. Uh, before we close out, I wanted to talk with you. I know you are somewhat of an athlete, right? You, do, do you run? I run. You run. Okay. Um, have you run a marathon? I have not run a marathon. Okay. I, yeah, there's a lot of signs when you run <laughs> half marathons that say only half is crazy. And right, right. I am not – I don't have enough time to train for a full Gosh, marathon. Yeah. It's – Enough to train for a half, half and breaking out those two-hour windows to yeah. go and run the long run. So how did you feel the first time you ran a, two, uh, a marathon, a half marathon? My mother and my father both run long distances as well. And okay. my mother was at the end of the hall guy at the finish line when I ran it the first time. And she's crying and I'm crying. <laughs> and so um, there was a lot of emotion there. Yeah. I didn't walk well for a couple of days. <laughs> uh, it's now to the point where I, 
think I'm at 16. I've done 16 now. Wow. So oh. I don't walk well for a few hours. A few now, hours now. Yeah, it's not as bad. It's not as bad. Yeah, that's one of my that's one of my bucket list goals. I hate I hate saying bucket list, but it's one of my before I leave this earth, I want to run a marathon. <laughs> but I think I will start with a half marathon. I have a good friend that this year he made a commitment that he was running a marathon on every continent. And he is right now, like as we record this, he is sitting in an airport in Santiago, Chile, waiting for a a plane to take him to Antarctica. So That's can, amazing. It is amazing. So, and every time I looked up, he was just in Africa last month. He did it, and he's an entrepreneur, so he's got the time and all that to do that. And it's just been he's he's kind of made it a really interesting thing, and he's actually has raised a lot of money for a lot of really cool programs through this, which I think is another good way to do that when you give back and you want to get other people involved with what you're doing. So it's not just you by yourself. So I, I thought that's kind of cool. But you now I applaud you for, for, for working out. Northwest Arkansas is certainly an outdoor outdoorsman paradise, right? Outdoors person paradise. It is. So there's a lot to do. But you know, I, I, I think I've taken up enough of your time and certainly I want to, to close this out with, with just asking you a couple of questions about things that you like to do when you're not doing all the amazing things that you're already doing with single parent scholarship fund, uh, the Coleman foundation, what you're doing here as a patent attorney, what do you and your husband and your two kids like to do? Uh, three kids, three kids. I'm sorry. I don't want to shortchange you. I've got three. I know how it is. Sometimes we forget about them, but yes, I've got three. Um, so what, what do you guys like to do, uh, in, in off times? So my kids like to play video games, and I play with them. I mean, I grew up playing Mario and Zelda and all the lovely, fun Nintendo games back then, and so we play those now. And Is that the Wii or? Uh, the Switch now. Switch, oh, right. Yeah, those things are we nice. We have the – no, I think we got rid of the Wii. We had the Wii. We had the Wii U. We right. still have that because it still has the old Zelda on it. And I'm not getting rid of that one anytime soon. No, I don't blame but, you. I don't blame yeah. you. So, okay. So, so tell me, um, where do you like to eat here in Northwest Arkansas? Preacher's Son. Preacher's Son. I love it. Okay. I, I have um, issues with gluten, so knowing that I can go there and eat anything I want. And nothing, anything. And nothing will be contaminated. <laughs> right, right, right. We stress that anything. I, I know Matt very well. Uh, he's been on this show uh, I'll I'll put a link to his show in the show notes, but but the preacher's son is outstanding, and I I think maybe um, one of my favorite items there is is the uh, the fried chicken, which chicken is, schnitzel. Yeah, it's I the mean best it's thing ever, ever, ever. So really, really good food, and um, you know there are a lot of people in this area. Uh, there are a lot of restaurants that are offering, um, you know food and recipes for folks that have gluten intolerance or gluten insensitive gluten sensitivities so certainly want to encourage you to check that out one of the goals that I was ha- I was I have is to create a little guide uh, for people that um, are either eating 100% gluten free or just want to know places that offer gluten free items you know cuz there is a difference there some people just yeah. don't want to you know I went a year and a half without eating any wheat uh, of any kind, and uh, it was a glorious year and a half. My headaches went away. A lot of things were different in that time frame, and I've slowly weaned myself back onto the wheat. And but I don't eat it. I don't uh, consume it as much as I used to. So, but it's it's just nice to know that people kind of care about that stuff around here, and it makes a big difference. So, you know, lots of options here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, finally, uh, the last book that you read. Um, I think you had mentioned something about uh, Nomen or. Yeah, it wasn't the last one it read, but it's the last one that stands out the most. I mean, I, I tend to read a lot of science fiction, and um, but that one was not just science fiction. It was sort of like a true crime, but also AI right. and social media and essentially what happens when there's a crime committed and when the government knows everything because we've let it know everything. everything. Right, right. And it was, it's an interesting book. It's a bit thick, but um, it was worth it, it's worth and it, it yeah. really kind of. I rem- it's broken up in sections too. You, so you get through a certain part, and suddenly you hit this completely different 
book. Really? And that was a little disconcerting at first, but it's it's a great book. I, okay. I really did enjoy it. Yeah, I'm going to have to check that out. And I think I had mentioned to you, I, I, I've been reading, and I'm currently reading The Laws of Human Nature by Robert Greene. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing book that really just makes you think. Um, I could go on and on about this book. It's it's a probably as it's it it could be it could double as a doorstop. It's that thick. It's probably about six hundred pages. But it's it's the, one of the few books this year that I've actually purchased, and it's part of my 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 personal collection of books. Everything else I get in the library, I just you know I read and and return. But this was this was a must have. I, I first took it out in the library, then I bought the book because it's just uh, it's that good. So definitely want to encourage people to check out Robert Greene's book, um, The Laws of Human Nature. And uh, I think that's about it. I, I really appreciate the the lessons on giving. The, and and also the just the impromptu legal lesson that, <laughs> that we got here today. So I don't. I mean, I know you know my my, my cousin's an attorney and she charges at six six minute increments. So I'm hoping that the bill isn't too high here. But uh, but no, you you really were, were so gracious with your with your time and and with your with your knowledge. And and I I also just want to say that you're certainly um, uh, the embodiment of what I have seen here in Northwest Arkansas of people that give back to the community. They don't, you're, you're not just there with your hand out um you've you've got you've have figured out a way to to really give back to this community so i certainly want to applaud you for that and to keep walking the walk and encouraging others like me and those that that see you and see the difference that you're making in this community so thank you very much i appreciate that thank you and that's very kind yeah absolutely so there you have it folks meredith k lowry from right Lindsay jennings they are in a, they are a firm. They're based in Little Rock. They have an office up here in Rogers. Uh, if you need anything in the way of copyright or patent law, please give Meredith a call. If you're calling her because you heard about her here on the podcast, just let her know. Give her a shout out and say, hey, girl, I heard you on that podcast. That was great. You know, can you help me? And uh, I'm sure she'll be able to help you out. So that's all I have for you today. I really appreciate you guys listening to this episode. I appreciate you guys sharing this podcast on a regular basis. Uh, Again, remember, our, our whole goal here is to expand and talk about the intersection of business, culture, entrepreneurship, and life here in the Ozarks. I certainly want to encourage you to go out, if you can, and just get 1% better today, and you'd be amazed at what you're able to accomplish. That's all I have for now. I will see you next week. Peace. We hope you enjoyed this episode of I Am Northwest Arkansas. Check us out each and every week, available anywhere that great podcasts can be found. For show notes or more information on becoming a guest, visit IamNorthwestArkansas.com. We'll see you next week on I Am Northwest Arkansas.